These two monitors have got a feature which I've never seen before in the 300 plus monitors that I've tested so far. First off, we have got the AOC 24P4U, which sports a flat 23.8 inch IPS panel that has a resolution of full HD and a refresh rate that goes up to 120 Hz. Then we have also got the Q27P4U, which has got a flat 27 inch IPS panel with a resolution of 1440p and a refresh rate of 120 hertz. Both monitors have got a variety of different connectivity options such as HDMI display ports and also support adaptive sync technologies. Elsewhere, both models have got an industry leading five year warranty and feature TCO certified generation 10 authentication, which highlights the monitor's sustainability credentials. Now, at the time of filming and in the UK, the full HD model can be found for roughly £144, while the QHD model can be found for roughly £200. Now, in this video, which has been sponsored by the manufacturer, I'll be covering everything you need to know about them so you can make your own informed purchasing decision. And of course, I'll be comparing and contrasting between Full HD and 1440p. So let's kick things off and compare the overall productivity and text clarity of these monitors. Indeed, over here, I'm referring to the overall resolution and form factor. First off, you have got the Full HD model with a 23.8 inch form factor and therefore giving it a pixel density of 93. Overall image itself looks actually pretty sharp, which is also aided by the fact that you've got that IPS panel giving you good viewing angles. If however you want to up the ante and you've got the extra space to accommodate it, the 27 inch 1440p monitor will give you a pixel density of 108.79. Indeed text looks just a little bit sharper. Let alone that, given the fact that you've got that larger size, it means that when it comes to snapping windows or tabs to left or right, or indeed in terms of the corners, then it means that you've just got that little bit of extra real estate to play around with. That is, this is also dependent as to how far you are away from the monitor. This is of course quite subjective. Personally, I'm roughly 60 to 70 centimeters away from my monitor and therefore means that the 27 inch form factor with its 1440p resolution really worked for me. But I'll be curious to know what you would pick down in the comment section below. So moving swiftly on, we get on to image quality and both these monitors have got a dedicated sRGB mode that you can select via the monitor's OSD. It's also good to see that you've got full brightness control. Now concentrating on the full HD model first, you have got a gamut coverage of 96.1% and a gamut volume of 98.6%. Below you can see how it compares to the standard. The average DLT sits at a very low 0.97 and a maximum of 1.65. Indeed, this can be used for serious image editing work or video grading. The tested contrast ratio clocks in at 1317 to 1 with the measured white point clocking in very close to the 6504 Kelvin target at 6352 Kelvin at 100%. Below you can see how it tracks with the Gamma 2.2 standard. Now flicking over we go on to the panel native mode on the Full HD model. And here you can see that the Gamma coverage and Gamma volumes have been affected across the board. Here below you can see yet again how it compares to the sRGB standard and it's no surprise over here to learn that the overall color accuracy in terms of the average delta T and maximum delta T are negatively effective and therefore increased at 1.49 and 4.13 respectively. The measured white point does actually get even tighter at 6479 Kelvin at 100% and yet again below you can see how it compares to the Gamma 2.2 standard. Now next up we get onto its larger sibling, the 27 inch 1440p monitor. And yet again, in terms of its sRGB mode, you can see the gamut coverage sits at 96.7% and a gamut volume of 100.5%. Below you can see how it compares to the standard. The average delta E and maximum delta E are yet again pretty impressive at 1.18 and 2.63. The measured white point comes in at 6,172 Kelvin at 100% in comparison to the 6,504 Kelvin target and a tested contrast ratio raises to 1,525 to 1. Below you can also see how it tracks to the Gamma 2.2 standard. Now moving on to the panel native mode, you can see over here that the Gamma coverage and Gamma volumes again have been affected across the board. Yet again, concentrating on the sRGB standard, you can see that the average delta E and the maximum delta E have been negatively affected, which again is no surprise, sitting at 2.32 and 7.28 respectively. 
the tester's contrast ratio does not change, while the measured white point does shift to 7,294 Kelvin at 100%. Thankfully, the Gamma 2.2 standard is actually pretty close to what it should be targeting. Aside from the color test, we should also talk about brightness. And here, the Full HD model achieved a peak of 343 nits and a minimum of 33 nits, while the 1440p model achieved a maximum of 447 nits and a minimum of 40 nits. Both these monitors will be perfectly usable in a bright sunlit room, with of course the 1440p monitor not having to be ramped up as much, and both of them also have got good level of minimum brightness, meaning that they can be used in a pitch black scenario. Speaking of which, this does bring me on to the overall brightness uniformity, and you here you'll be able to see how the 24 inch model performed, and equally how the 27 inch model performed. As for the overall IPS bleed, which is of course present given the overall panel type that's been chosen for both the monitors, here you can see how the 1080p model performs depending on the different angles, and equally over here how the 27 inch model performed across the board. Aside from all of this, they are also easy on the eyes thanks to the hardware based low blue mode and flicker free technology which even earned them the TUV Eye Comfort 4 out of 5 star certification. So moving on, we get on to the overall build quality, and both these monitors are absolutely identical, other than of course the overall form factor being different. Here you've got a three side boreless design with a relatively thin bottom bezel. I also like the fact that you have got a non garish rectangular stand, which has also got a small little cutout at the front. Useful, for example, if you just want to move the monitor forwards or backwards, or of course, by placing a smartphone in this area, in terms of it being in the landscape or portrait format. Then you have also got the built-in stand itself, which provides you good sort of ergonomic controls. You've got height, tilt, and pivot adjustments. You do also have a swivel function, although here it's worth pointing out that it's not the monitor itself that swivels, but rather the entire stand. And that's because there is a small little plate that's found underneath the stand itself, which allows you to have said functionality. Of course, if you do want to replace the built-in stand, you can do so with a Visa compatible one, allowing you to place it on a multi-monitor setup or a monitor arm. Now in order for you to interact with the monitor, there are some physical buttons that are placed at the front at the bottom right hand side. And this actually makes it very intuitive to not only navigate the monitor's OSD, but also to adjust the settings to your liking. Indeed over here, the OSD itself is very comprehensively laid out and provides you a plethora of options which you might want to play around with. So next up we get on to connectivity, and here is where the monitors actually differ, because the Full HD model has got an HDMI 1.4 port and a DisplayPort 1.2 input as well. Here you've also got a VGA input, therefore allowing you to connect up to some older legacy devices. While the 1440p monitor is a little bit more modern, because it's got two HDMI 2.0 ports and a singular DisplayPort 1.2 input instead. Both these monitors will be able to output their native resolution at up to 120Hz. It is worth highlighting however that the 1440p monitor has got a native 8-bit panel while the Full HD monitor has got 6-bit plus FRC. Through the digital input, and by that I mean HDMI and DisplayPort, you can route audio through the monitors. And here you have got a 3.5mm jack which is found underneath the monitor, allowing you to plug in your headphones directly into them. You have also got two 2 watt speakers built in, which will suffice for basic Windows notification or of course video conferencing. Now elsewhere, you have got a USB Type B input, and this is certainly something that you might want to connect up to, because it allows you to utilize the USB ports which are found on the monitor itself. Here underneath, you have got two USB Type A 3.2 ports, and with a pop-out function, and therefore at the front of the monitor, you'll find a further USB Type A port and a Type C port, the latter delivering up to 15 watts of power. Yes indeed, this is the very first time that I've ever come across a monitor that has a pop-out USB hub, and it just does exactly what it says on the tin. Very handy if you do want to plug in a flash drive, or for example you've got any sort of peripherals that you do want to quickly connect up to. Very much useful because a lot of other competing products, including other monitors that are offered from AUC themselves, do not offer such functionality. 
and meaning that if you do want to regularly use the USB ports, you'll have to reach around the monitor, for example, towards the side or underneath, therefore making it far less convenient in comparison to the pop-out USB hub, which is provided on the P4 series. Now elsewhere, I would also like to mention that these monitors have got adaptive sync technologies and therefore would be handy in certain scenarios. Furthermore, you've got that refresh rate that goes up to 120 Hz, therefore giving you some extra bit of fluidity. Even when it comes to a desktop scenario, it's very much appreciated. Now with all that out of the way, I'll be curious to know what you make of these monitors down in the comment section below and how you feel a pop-out USB hub might actually improve your overall workflow or productivity. Now, if you've enjoyed this video, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been totally dubbed and I hopefully see you next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.